Hey everybody, my name is Chris Rouse. I'm the lead pastor here at, at Faith Church. And some of you are new. There's a lot of new faces here today. You're welcome to Faith Church. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, some of you have been visiting with us for a while. Some of you are family. We've got several pack a few days. I didn't even know that it was, but the divorce are packing a few over here. We've got the Osmonds over there, the Hoofers over there, the Franklins. I mean, we've got a lot of family here today. So that's very good because we're going to be talking about a very family-centric kind of idea this morning. Uh, the, the one another is the series uh, that we've been in is, uh, is crucial to us being together as a church and, and how we come together and how we uh, learn together and grow together. And, and so there's a lot of stuff we, we need to, to figure out what the, what the Bible is saying about it. But the very first week we stood up here and, and introducing the series to you, I said, love one another. This was the, the most important thing because everything flows out of this love. And, and uh, before I preached that sermon, I, I thought I would do something really technical, which is not my forte here. But uh, I asked Siri to define love for us. Am I, am I ringing out there? Can you hear a ring? Is that just my ears ringing? All right, turn me down just a little bit, especially while I'm looking down. All right, hang on. We'll find it. Here we go. Siri, define love. Checking my sources. Found my definitions of love. The first one is a strong positive emotion regarding affection. A strong positive emotion regarding affection. I thought, well, man, that sounds pretty fun. I'm going to bring her back here a little bit to find something else for it. But I thought, man, she, I thought she'd be a little more romantic than that. She's got a sweet voice. She tells me a lot of things that I need to know, gives me directions for where I, where I need to go. But she basically came up with this. Uh, love is the capacity. If you've got your sermon notes today, pull these out because I want you to fill in the blanks and, and stay engaged with us here a little bit uh, if you can. But she says love is the capacity in our being to place value or worth to something or someone. And, and then this whole idea of loving one another, we have to get an understanding of what true love is. And we endeavor to do that. By finding the biblical definition of love and what it says about it, 1 Corinthians 13, that love is patient, that love is kind, love is not both, it's not envious, it's not jealous. It, it, it's, it endures all things, it hopes all things, it bears all things. Love never fails. It doesn't hold grudges, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. This is what true biblical love is. And, but we come at it much like series love, a, a capacity in our being to place value or worth to something. So I can easily look at you and say, hey, I love you, and I love my wife. But I'm going to love you differently than I love my wife. I love my church. I, I, I love uh, a good steak. I love chocolates. I love non-human weather. I love unsweet tea uh, with, with the three packs of Splenda in it. And I love all of that stuff, you know? And but we love differently. The love that we were talking about, the, the true definition of, of Bible love, of God-like love, is what we say was the agape love. Remember, the Greek word agape means unconditional love. There's no unlesses in that love. There's no buts in that love. It is pure, unconditional. No matter what you do, I'm going to love you anyway. And so the whole sermon series was kind of, it, it's birthed out of this because, and, and you can write this in your notes today, I say love is the root of all of this. And all the other one another's are the fruit. If you don't have a genuine love for each other, you're going to have a hard time, what Brian talked about the last couple of weeks, serving one another and bearing one another's burdens. It all comes out of this love. And, and he used a great analogy in his sermon on, on loving one another. He said, there was the, there's this, uh, in northern Israel, there's a large sea called the Sea of Galilee. And just north of the Sea of Galilee, there's a large mountain called Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon flows, has tributaries and stuff that flows fresh, clean water out of this mountain and into this lake called the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. And so what happens then is everything, it forms this beautiful, large lake, or what is called the sea, and there's a lot of life in it. And back in the Bible days, the disciples were, were fishermen, and, and you made your living on this lake, and people built towns and, and villages around this, this big sea. And so Mount Hermon flows into the Sea of Galilee, and out of the Sea of Galilee flow a couple other tributaries, but one main one that goes all the way south into the southern part of Jerusalem called the Jordan River. You heard this before? The Jordan River. This is where Jesus was baptized, where John the Baptist was doing his baptizing, and Jesus was baptized in this river. So up north, you've got Mount Hermon, you've got Sea of Galilee, and you've got a long river, Jordan River, and it runs into what is called the 
salt sea or the Dead Sea. You've heard of this before in Israel, right? And you can see the minerals and the salt deposits there. And many of you have been there. Some of you have, have taken off your shoes and socks and, and waded off into there. Our, our piano player, uh, he took, he's got a picture of himself floating in the Dead Sea. Uh, his wife, Barry, who used to teach in Jerusalem, has been there many times. And she said, you can't not float in the salt sea. It doesn't matter how much you weigh or how dense your body is. Everybody floats in the salt sea because of the contents of what's in there. But the analogy that Brian was using with us is there's nothing that flows out of the Dead Sea. It has become this collection of minerals and salt and, and these deposits of, 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 of uh, elements and things like that, that that keep it there. And it's become a very stagnant, non-life uh, water source. Everything is flowing into it, but nothing's flowing out. And I thought it was such a great analogy and because what is happening here today, what we've got to learn from is that love is the root, right? Love is the Mount Hermon and everything flows out of this thing. When something flows into us and then stuff, stuff has to flow out of us. Because of the love of Christ, because of what he's shown to us, then other things come out. So if we have the love of Christ in us, flowing into us, we are compelled, we are burdened, we are obligated to have service flow out. Because of his love for me, I am going to serve another. Because of his love and how he sacrificed for me, I have no problem with bearing one another's burdens and coming alongside and lifting up a brother and walking with someone through a difficult time. Today we're going to talk about encouraging one another. How difficult would it be to encourage one another if you've got really no love for them, right? How difficult would it be to serve one another or to bear their burdens or get involved in their life and their troubling circumstances if you don't have a true Christ-like love for one another. And the whole point of the matter of the gathering of the saints of God into a place like this is that we all have an opportunity to share together in this. It doesn't matter if you've been here for the first time or you've been here a hundred times. It doesn't matter. As the people of God, where they are assembled together, we have an obligation because of the love of Christ and how it compels us to love, to serve, to bear with, and to encourage one another. Okay? So if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles today to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 is where we'll be today. And I realize that sometimes you get out um, and you forget it or you misplace your Bible. And uh, what we do here at Faith Church is we want to make sure that everybody has a copy of Scripture to look on to. So if you raise your hand, I'll bring you one. Larry's back there in that ugly shirt again. He'll bring you a uh, he'll bring you a Bible. So there's one right there by you. Anybody else need one? I'll bring it to you. You got one here on the edge? Good. Charlie, you're going to tell right here. Carson, for sure, raise your hand. Alright, we'll make sure everybody's got one. You got another one? Who else needs one? Right here, please. We've got several. If you need a Spanish Bible, we've got some of those too. I never go forget. Uh, she's not here today. This is Patsy Palmer. She's one of our beloved members. And she came in one day. She forgot hers. And so she grabbed one of the black Bibles that we have. And, and she pulled out. And I knew because I saw her pick it up. She picked up the Spanish Bible on the stage. And so when it came time for everybody to stand and read the scripture, I said, hey, Patsy, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, why don't you read for us today? And so she picks it up. And she kind of cocks her head, turns it around a little bit, and just adjusting her glasses and like, no, she wasn't going to read that for anything. So if you picked up the Spanish Bible by mistake, it's okay. Uh, you're going to, I think it's, uh, uh, what is the Spanish word? Hebreos or something like that for some of you that are following along. But I've got the page number if you're borrowing one of ours. If you're unfamiliar with Scripture, it's in the back part of the Bible in the New Testament. But uh, as you find it, stay with me if you would. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. We're just going to look at a few verses here today. <coughs> That doesn't mean I'm going to preach short. It just means that we're going to look at a few verses today. Don't get your hopes up. All right. Hebrews 10, verse 22 is where we pick it up. And it starts with this. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Heavenly Father, this is your book. It is your word. It is the revelation of yourself. 
in your purpose for us. Holy Spirit, would you enlighten us today, teach us, instruct us, point us to Christ, and to point us to the truth today. May this word be a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path for truth and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in verse 22 here, but it, I couldn't leave it out because it's such a compelling piece of scripture. And it's, and it's really the first thing we got to come to because how can we encourage one another? How can we receive encouragement from one another if there's not first a relationship with Christ where we're drawing near unto him? And so verse 22 starts off, let us draw near with a what? A sincere heart. A sincere heart, one based out of genuineness and, and real love and concern is one without hypocrisy or pretense, all right? Drawing near is not the same thing as owning a Bible and coming to church. That's not drawing near to Christ. Uh, drawing near to Christ is not the same thing as, as, as helping little old ladies across the street or, or holding somebody's backpack when they walk into school or, or anything like that. It has nothing to do with that. Drawing near to Christ is drawing near with a sincere heart and pouring yourself into Him as He pours Himself into you. Fully surrendered, fully trusting, faith, hope, strength, everything that we have, drawing near to Him. It says we come with full assurance of faith. That is a, a trusting obedience in Christ. And then having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We're not talking about physicalness here. We're talking about the regeneration of our heart and our mind. Something made brand new. Because you can't come to Christ on your own. You can't all of a sudden decide one day, hey man, I've been this wretch all my life. I'm just going to decide I'm going to flip the switch today and all of a sudden be a Christian. It doesn't happen that way. It happens almost backwards in this verse that our evil consciences and our bodies are washed with pure water. That is that we have been regenerated. We have been born again. And once we realize that, our faith and our hope and our trust is placed in Christ and we draw near to Him. It's important that we start here today because this is the founding piece of what we talk about in encouragement and hope and, and strength and confidence that we have in Him. So verse 22 Drawing near with a sincere heart, a pure heart and mind, and full assurance of faith. Now verse 23 and verse 24 is where we'll spend the bulk of our time today. Verse 23 says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So as you fill in your blanks today, let us draw near, first of all, to Christ, and then let us, let us hold fast. There's an implication here in holding fast that we're holding on to something, hence the song that we just sang a little while ago. We're holding on, we're holding on, we're holding on, as if there's a danger of something or someone prying us away. It's easy to say, you know, come into church and to hear a good word and go, hey man, that sounds great. And, I'm protected, I'm safe at church, right? And then you go out into the world and now what? We're holding on. There's trial and there's struggle and there's hardship. And, and Jesus promised that this was going to come. And, and he says, but, but look at the, the author of Hebrews says, hold on though, hold fast. How do we hold on? He says, without wavering. If you have an NIV, it may say unswervingly. In Ephesians 4, we, we learn about being tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine. There's, there's something that's trying to pull you apart. And the hope that you're clinging to, the confession of the hope that you're clinging to, is we're holding on to this because of all the hardship around it's threatening to pull us away. It was doing that for the people in this Hebrew audience here. The how is without wavering. The what is the confession. We're not going to lose hope, but he said, some of you are losing your confession, you're losing your testimony, you see, because of the intensity of the persecution and the hardship that was around them, they were losing uh, their, their idea and losing the truth of what they were there to do and why they were there. The what is the confession, the who is the hope. The author says, hold fast, hold fast to the confession of your hope, and you see what was going on, because of the intensity of the persecution, because of the rejection of, of those around them, they were being cast out, they were wandering from the faith. They were trying to say, okay, this new life, this confession of Christ is not suiting me very well because it's ending up in beatings and imprisonment and stonings and death and loss. So back in the day when I followed the law of Moses and all I had to do was kind of check off my box and follow the right rules, nobody persecuted me for that. 
And so the early church, the early believers found themselves wandering and wavering from the confession of Christ and going back to the easy rule following way. And it, it wasn't working out so well for them. They were wandering away from the confession and they were wavering in their church attendance. As we'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Instead of running to the church and running to other believers for support and for help, they were fleeing from the church, wavering in their confession. And the author says, hold on. Hold on. And the question will come, why do I hold on? Look at all the stuff that's going on around me. Look at how the world is caving in all around me. Why do I hold on? For he who promised, say it, is faithful. He who promised is faithful. In just about two, three chapters over from this, you're going to read that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He was faithful yesterday. He'll be faithful today. He'll be faithful forevermore. You can hold on. I know it's intense, he says. I'm right there with you. I know the hardships that you're facing. I know the persecution that is there. I, I, I understand. I've experienced myself. He's saying, I understand where you are, but hold fast the confession of your hope. Don't waver. Don't wonder. Hold on swervingly. Hold steadfastly to this hope. Because he who promised is faithful. I was reading a sermon manuscript this week from a man named Kenneth Boa. I'm not sure who, who he was, but I googled this scripture and, and uh, his sermon came up and I was reading through a piece of his manuscript and he, he had some concluding thoughts and he shared these things. He said, people cannot live without hope. And that caught my eye because I thought, well, that's very true. He says, throughout history, human beings have endured the loss of many things. People have lost their health, their finances, their reputation, their careers, even their loved ones, and yet have endured the pages of history books are filled with those who suffered pain, rejection, isolation, persecution, and abuse. There have been people who faced concentration camps with unbroken spirits and unbowed heads. People who have been devastated by Job-like trials and yet found the strength to go on without cursing God and dying. Humans can survive the loss of almost anything, but not without hope. There's something within each of us that compels us to have hope. And when that's gone, it's very troubling. He goes on to say, hope is how we live. Hope is what gets us from one day to the next. A person goes to school and hopes that one day he'll graduate. The person graduates and hopes that one day he will enter into a great career. If he is single, he hopes that perhaps one day he will meet the right person to get married. He gets married and hopes that one day he and his wife will when they have children, they hope that they will live long enough to get the kids out of the house. We live by hope. And when hope is gone, endurance and joy and energy and courage just evaporate. Life itself begins to fade. When hope goes, we start to die. There was someone that came up to me before the service and they asked me for prayer. They just had a friend. Uh, that was just found in it, that had committed suicide recently. And they're, I'm sure, asking questions. I'm sure they're emotionally devastated, as many of you have probably had family members or loved ones or co-workers or someone like that that you know that has experienced that. And you're left with a bunch of questions. What compelled you to do that? What compelled them to get to the end of their rope so far and realized that there was nothing left. Couldn't have been that there was just no hope left. Circumstances were too heavy. Their trials and their struggles were, were too overwhelming. They saw no way out. There was no hope. And they ended their own life. Can you see the, the passion inside the author here as he's pleading with his listeners? Can you see the, the, the burden which he carries for the church and, and the desire for the church? I know, I know, I know, more importantly, he knows. So hold on, hold fast, hang in there. There's going to be a better day. He's going to see you through to the end. How do I know this? Because he who promised is faithful. There should be no 
such thing, church. There should be no such thing as a hopeless Christian. You may waver in your confession. You may waver in your testimony from time to time. Sin is still going to have oftentimes a, a grip on us, and we're going to try to be constantly battling the flesh and the spirit. But we got to understand this. There's always hope. Let me, let me compare and contrast here with you a little bit. Uh, my, the small group that, that I lead on Monday nights, we're going through a uh, class called Biblical Foundations. And we were talking about this a little bit, the difference between hope and how we define hope. And, and the most popular definition in the room as we went around the room was a wish. You wish something happens and, and, and you, you're kind of expecting or, or hoping or dreaming or something like that's going to happen. And the hope that we talk about that you can lose is, is, is kind of like that wishful thinking. It is this idea that we hope that something is going to happen, but it's not quite like this. So last night I was thinking, okay, what is, how would we define wish? And so I thought, well, I'm going to ask my friend Siri again to see if she can help us out. So, hang on. Define wish. Which means for or express a strong desire of hope for something that is not easily attainable. One something that cannot or probably will not happen. She talks kind of fast. Um, but she's been from the home dictionary, so she's got to get a few things out. She says, a wish is to want something that cannot or probably will not happen. That's a wish. Something that cannot or probably will not happen. She says, a strong desire for something that is not easily attainable. It's not easily attainable and it probably won't happen. That's a wish. When we talk about holding fast to the confession of your hope, we're talking about a biblical hope. A hope that is centered in Christ and founded in the love of Christ. It's so much more than wishful thinking. Hope is a fact. This is something that is absolutely certain. It's just not yet realized. You can expect it to happen. You can anticipate that it's going to happen. It is our faith looking forward as if it's already happened and we're going to receive it. In Romans chapter 5, we, we understand that there's a hope that is born out of, of, of trouble and, and, and hardship and tribulation. But he says, guess what? You can rejoice in this kind of hope. How in the world am I going to rejoice in, in hardship and, and trial and tribulation? Because he says, look, because what's going to happen out of that trial is going to produce perseverance in you, a steadfastness in you. And what that steadfastness is going to do is it's going to prove your character. It's going to test and strengthen your resolve and your character. And once you've come through all of that, you're going to be stronger than you ever were. You're going to be more in Him than you ever have been. And all of a sudden you're going to be able to say, this hope does not disappoint it's not wishful thinking. It's not something so unattainable that we're probably not going to get it. It's something that you can bank on and it will not disappoint you. Yeah, Paul would go on to write to the church in Colossae, Colossians 1. He says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope. It is the sure, steadfast hope. In Hebrews chapter 6, he calls it the anchor of our soul. When the storm is raging and the sea is tossing you to and fro and, and the wind is blowing and the thunder is crashing and the lightning is flashing, everywhere you look there's just nothing but the storm, the storm, the storm. If you're a Vanderbilt fan, you're really about this. He said, anchor down. This hope is the confession of your hope. is the anchor of your soul. 1 Peter 1, 3 says, God causes us to be born again to a living hope. And while you're writing in a living hope, just underneath that, put a lasting hope. This is a living hope that we live with now. This is a lasting hope because in verse 5 of that passage, it says that that hope is protected by the power of God. Your salvation, your confession of your hope is protected by the power of God. It was never yours to earn. It was never yours to buy. It's never yours to lose. And this encouragement, which is our study today that I haven't quite even talked about yet, this real encouragement that we're talking about is rooted in this love and is born out of this hope. It's a necessary part of our walk of faith. We must be about doing this because discouragement exists. Encouragement has to be a necessary part of our journey. There's a lot of biblical evidence for this, and, 
and 109 times is the Greek word used in the New Testament that defines what we're talking about in encouragement today. You ready for this? Parakaleo. Parakaleo is the word that we're using. 109 times this word is used throughout the New Testament. And you'll see it in our English word used in, in, in different ways. It means to build up, edify, exhort, admonish, teach. Uh, these, are, these are other words that we use for this. And it's a compound word. The para means to, from, to be close, to be near, from close beside. The other part, kaleo, means to call. And in essence, the word is, is literally meaning to call to one side for the purpose of giving aid to someone. You see that? To call to one side. To call to come near. To be near someone. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says that we are to encourage one another. We are to parakaleo, call to one side for the purpose of building one another up. And to encourage them. Our concept of courage, the way we define it in our English word, it means to bring courage. To bring courage. There's courage lacking, there's fear, there's turmoil, there's hardship, and we come alongside to build up, to bring courage, to bring confidence in someone else that they're not on our own. Courage, as defined by Stephen J. Cole, says this, courage is the quality of mind that enables people to encounter difficulty and danger with firmness and resolve in spite of inner fears. To continue on the pressures of life by faith so we don't throw in the towel. Have you ever felt that close? Have you ever been in a place where you felt like, man, everything is crashing in on around me, I'm ready to just give up and give in? You may have experienced that before. Maybe not to the point of our friend who's, who's in his own life. But maybe you felt so desperate, so underneath the burden and underneath the weight of it, you didn't know what to do. And you didn't know how to cope. You didn't know how to deal with it. You needed somebody. You needed somebody. If I was going into a, a dark alley in an inner city and there was uh, gangs all around and there was trouble all around and things like that, stand up, Danielle. I'm not going to walk into that alley feeling a lot of confidence with Danielle. <laughs> I'm just not. I'm, I'm just. I'm just not going. Now, okay, so you said now stand up, Lisa. Lisa's a little taller than her, but with those heels on, Lisa's not going to be able to run around with me and run the table. Okay, you know who I want to go to that alley with? You can sit down. Stand up, Malcolm. <laughs> That's who I want to go to that alley with. take care of business behind me and I won't be chased. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I got an old friend here today. I haven't seen him in a long time. And uh, we used to play basketball a lot together. He was a pretty terrible basketball player, but he was a great moving <coughs> man. And uh, my friend John Trevillian over there in the corner is here today. And, uh, and he, he didn't score a lot. Uh, you could, you know, outrun him and get around him as slow as Christmas. But guess what? Man, when I had the ball, and he came out and set that big old wide pick like that, and then would move a little bit to help me out, <laughs> I was wide open all day long. We formed a great team together. I had a lot of courage, a lot more encouragement when I had large people around me to help take care of my physical problems. <laughs> Helpful, wasn't it? In spite of, of my adversity, in spite of the danger, in spite of, of the fear, of the difficulty that was around me, I could go into it with courage, knowing that someone was there with me. I think we would all agree with the assessment of, of this one uh, blog writer that, that I like to read a lot. His assessment says, without encouragement, hardship becomes meaningless. And our will to go on begins to wane. Without encouragement, hardship is meaningless. We don't learn anything in hardship. We just learn how desperate we become. Without someone there to encourage, to bring courage, to add confidence to us, it becomes meaningless. And our courage begins to wane. He goes on to say, where encouragement exists, it's easier to love, isn't it? It's easier to live, to sacrifice for others. To offer hope and help to others in need when, when there are those around you. 
more than likely, for those of you that have been in the church for very long, you've probably been compelled or guilted or shamed into maybe going out and knocking on a door or sharing your faith or giving someone a track or something like that. And by yourself, you were probably terrified. And your whole gospel presentation was, here, Jesus loves you. And then you would run from him. <laughs> you would hand him a gospel track and you would say, hey, there's something helpful in there. I hope you, I hope you like it. By yourself. But man, if you had a couple of guys around you, a couple of other people around you that really knew how to talk and really knew how to engage people. I mean, if you were with Billy Fugway, would you be really that terrified to know that he's going to do all the yapping anyway? <laughs> well, I mean, as personable as what he is and as good as what he is at talking to people, especially to strangers, and, man, he, is, he has changed me a lot in, in the way that I, I do people and the way that I can talk to people. And, and man, it's, it's really cool. I mean, strangers that... At Chick-fil-A, give me ice cream coach just because I say, hey, that looks pretty good. It looks like it's melting. I wouldn't want you to have that melting on somebody. Oh, you want this? Yeah, yeah, sure, I'll take it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I've formed a friend. <laughs> By the way, anybody who gives me ice cream is my friend. <laughs> but it's important to have somebody there. It's important to have a, a, a wingman, so to speak. We talked about this in the, in the first service. You know, Batman needs a Robin, doesn't he? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> you need a wingman. Every maverick needs a goose. Where encouragement exists, it's easier to love and to live and to sacrifice. Where it's lacking, though, fill in these places. And look at the desperation. Is where encouragement is lacking, where there is no brother to come alongside or a sister to help hold you up. Life seems pointless and burdensome. We get overwhelmed by life's pains and struggles, thinking that we can handle it on our own or thinking that we can make it through. You get to the point where you're so lonely that you just feel completely unloved. And you begin to believe the lie of the enemy and begins to say, God doesn't care for you. He doesn't even worry about you. He's got so many important things to worry about. And in your loneliness and in your despair, and without a godly brother or sister to come alongside and help bear you up, life is overwhelming. William Barclay, a great theologian and commentator, his commentary on this passage, he, he made the comment, he said, one of the highest human duties is the duty of encouragement. It's easy to laugh at men's ideals. It's easy to pour cold water on their enthusiasm. It's easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another, and many a time a word of praise, thanks, appreciation, or cheer has kept a man on his feet. Blessed is the man who speaks such a word. Hold fast, the author says. Hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then he goes on to say in verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let us consider. And I, if you're, while you're filling in that blank underneath that, there's another blank that says observe. You've got to pay attention. You've got to take notes. You've got to have your eyes open. You've got to get off yourself a little bit and look around. I would, I would say to David, if you took time to look around in the room today, as you, as you scan the audience in, in this room, you would be able to look at people and say, man, they kind of look like me. They kind of look like they're our, our kind of way of life, they, they got young kids, they got older kids, they got, you know, they're empty nesters, like, whatever, you can look around and you can, but you know what, for those of you that have been through hardship before, for those of you that have struggled, and have lived and gone through the struggle, and you can testify today that he who promised is faithful, you can look at some other folks, and you can go, man, they look just like I used to look. The way they talk, the way they look, you can just tell that there's a burden all over them. And what do you do with that? <laughs> Better him than me. <laughs> tell you that, that was rough when I was there. No. The author says, let us consider one another and consider how to stimulate one another, which means to provoke or to spur on one another. We've got to take our eyes off ourselves, and, because encouragement always is putting others first. It's looking out. If, if there's this purposed activity inside of us that requires thought and effort, 
It requires experience sometimes. I remember when we first started the church, uh, people were beginning to see our church sign, beginning to come in and, and begin to ask for help for stuff. And, you know, whether it was help with food or help with uh, a rent payment or uh, some, some bills, electrical, utility bills or something like that, we would bring them in to listen to them. And, and there was one, uh, one man that came in one day, and man, he began to pour out his heart. And me and Billy were the only ones here, so we were up there talking to him, and, and uh, I'm thinking, man, this dude has been rude. And he begins to just pour out his story to me, and, and uh, man, I was burdened for him. My heart was breaking for him, and, and uh, I was just tore up, and I was sharing scripture with him, and sharing that there's hope in Jesus, and now I'm sharing the gospel, and, and, uh, and just thinking, man, what, what can I do? I've got a, a mental Rolodex going in my head. Who in the church is, it has the means right now, has some financial wherewithal right now that can, I can give them a call, because the church didn't have a lot of budget back then, so I could give these guys a call, maybe they would, you know, help him out a little bit, or give him some food, or, or whatever. And so I was about to, to say, man, stay here and let me make, make a few calls. I said, Billy, is there anything that you'd like to add? And Billy said, yeah. He leaned across the table and he says, what are you on? And I looked at Billy. Billy's looking at this dude cold hearted, right in the eyeball. The guy said, what are you talking about? He said, what are you on right now? Man, I'm not on anything. I'm not on anything. And Billy said, you're lying to me. He said, your eyes are all bloodshot. He said, that beggar's been tapping this table ever since you sat down. He said, your knee has been knocking up against the side of that stool ever since you sat down. We've been here for 30 minutes and you haven't stopped twitching yet. What are you on? You've been high the moment that you walked through these doors. And I'm looking at him going, that's the worst counsel I've ever heard in my life. I didn't say that, but I'm thinking, I'm in a whole different place than what I thought I was getting ready to go with. <laughs> Billy could see it all over him. He'd been through that before. He'd been the one with the bloodshot eyes. He's been the liar who's just tapping the table and giving his tail the whole time. He's been the one with the shaking knee. He's been the one that's coming in and giving a story that's just a story. Oh, we're such a good team here. There's people I can reach that Billy doesn't know. There's people that Billy can touch that I, I can never understand or touch. It's an amazing thing when you come alongside someone. The author says to stimulate one another, to provoke them, to spur them on. It's as if we're asking the question to ourselves: What does this person need to help him grow in love and good deeds? It says to stimulate one another, to, to, uh, to provoke one another, to love and to good deeds. This is the whole point. is to encourage someone else to bring them up in love so that they can receive that love. And something as it flows into them can flow out of them, just like the Sea of Galilee. Truth and love flow into them, and then love and service and, and encouragement flows out of them for others. We talked a few weeks ago about putting the... Uh, this Greek word that means togetherness, it means sharing. It is a bearing one another's burdens. This is why it's so important when the body of Christ comes together. Because you know things I don't know. And I see things that you don't see. It's important that we mix together and we're, we're connected together and we're part of the body together. You've got to know things and I've got to know things and you've got to see things and I've got to see things. Koinonia. Sharing, togetherness, fellowship. Pastor and author Larry Crabb says this. He said, lost people need direction. And blind people need enlightening. And you stubborn people, you need pride. Lost people need direction. Blind people need enlightenment. And stubborn people need prodding. Where are they going to get it? Where are they going to hear it from? Who's going to come alongside and encourage them? Who's going to come alongside that that is weak and it is fallen, that is broken? And you're going to come and bring courage to them. Let me tell you, I used to be there. I encourage people all the time to, 
to get into a small group and to get connected with other people in a small group. And they'll tell me oftentimes, man, I've already taken that class. I already know about all that. I've, I've been through that. Man, I've walked through that. The Lord's taught me a lot. And, and, but I've already taken that. I've already read that book. And I'm like, you're perfect for this class. Because somebody else is getting, read it, getting ready to read it for the first time. And they're not going to know how to deal with that and with this stuff that's all over them. You've been there. You've done that. You've lived to tell the story that he who promised is faithful. Who's it going to be? It's not you. Are you just content? Are you just content with, hey, I'm here, aren't I? You're just lucky that I'm here. No. I don't believe in love. For one, I played golf long enough to know I'm not really lucky. I don't believe in that. And I'm never, ever going to feel lucky that you're just here. I love you more than that. My desire to encourage you is so much greater than that. Sometimes encouragement is positive. And it's uplifting. Sometimes it's not so positive. We have to admonish one another. That's next week. I thought I'd encourage you today. <laughs> Before we get to admonishing next week. We're not called to walk the road of life alone. God kindly gives us the grace of doing His encouragement and acceptance. He then provides us with the encouragement and acceptance of others. And then finally, He invites us to participate with Him in the giving of these same gifts to those who follow our lead. Verse 25 says, Not forsaking our sibling together. Okay, now before we talk about this, let's go back to verse 22. What are we supposed to do? Draw near to God. Because He has regenerated us and He's done a new work in our lives, we draw near to Him. We gain courage and strength and confidence from Him. Verse 23 says, Now hold fast the confession of your hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. Verse 24 says, Now extend that to others, consider others, and urge them on, and spur them on, provoke them, stimulate them to love and good deeds. How? Certain by not forsaking our sin when we gather. This is the gathering of the saints. This is the believers coming together. It says, as is the habit of some. So some were coming and receiving encouragement, and others, because of the persecution and because of the rejection, they were leaving, they were fleeing from the church. And this happens to you all the time, doesn't it? This happens to people when they, hardship comes and troubling times come, and, and now I'm embarrassed. I'm not going to come to church because I'm too embarrassed. I don't want to have other people know that I'm struggling. Are you kidding me? Where are you going to find help? Where are you going to find hope? Some of you will go so far to leave the church and you go so far you're going to find hope in the bottom of the bottle. Shoot up. Smoke up. Drink up. Shack up. You're looking for hope. You're looking for encouragement. You're looking for answers. It's the assembly together where we find the hope and the help and the power we see this. You can practice, yes. You can practice faith and hope when you're alone. But you can encourage others to love and good deeds when you're alone. We need each other. Please, don't forsake the assembly of the saints together. Can you read your Bible at home? You sure can. Can you encourage someone else to read your Bible while you're at home? No, you cannot. Can you have a small group with you and your wife and your kids at home? Yes, you can. But can you encourage someone else in the faith that's walking through some of the same struggles that you have at home? No, you cannot. It's important. Pastor Brian said it well last week. He said, no man is an island. No man is an island. We are together together. We are purposed by God to put us together. That's why He calls us the body of Christ. He's the head, and we are the body, and we are connected together. I remember a few years ago, I tore, a, uh, I tore my calf muscle. I got about a half inch tear in my calf muscle. And, and you know what my body did? I had to go and get it looked at. I had to get a boot on it. I had to get some, some medicine and stuff like that for it. And you know what happened? 
this part of my body had to be the anchor for the weaker part of my body. I had to walk around like this. I was supposed to be in this booth for six weeks. Supposed to be is a relative term sometimes because after a few weeks with this leg taking more of the burden, guess what? This leg got tired. I began to get shin splits in this leg because of so much weight that I was putting on this one. So I decided to do what I thought was best, take off that boot and to heal myself quicker. As if I could heal myself at all. And here I am, six years later, I still have a small tear in my calf muscle and any time I try to run for any kind of distance, other than my heart's about to explode and I break out into un uncurable sweating, uh, I have a, a real tight knot that forms in my calf that I can't get off of. I tried to heal myself. On my own, I thought I knew how to do it. And I'm still wounded. And I still carry that woundedness. Could have trusted. Could have hung in there. Needed someone to come alongside me and say, you big dummy, put that boot back on, let it heal the way it's supposed to. I use that in all encouragement, you big dummy. <laughs> Sometimes you need somebody to be honest with you. Sometimes you need somebody to come alongside and to bring courage and to bring truth in your life. And it can't be done alone. After Pentecost, we look in the scripture, after Pentecost, the wisdom and power and instruction of God to the church, to his people, has always been in the gathering together. The worshiping together, the serving together, the fellowshipping together, them bringing all their stuff to, to, to themselves and sharing what they have. In the assembling of the saints, we have an opportunity to receive blessing from others, yes, but also to be and to give a blessing. To others and to be encouraging to others. Now, for me, I look out over all of you and the ones in the early service today, and I think, I'm not going to get to all of you. It's impossible for me to to, to shepherd you and, and to, to give uh, to give everything that you need to you all the time. That's why it's so important for the body to be together. A healthy body cares and encourages its own. We'll take up when the other person is weak. When, other, when someone else is wounded, we pick them up and we come alongside of them. You do that for me. I do that for you. I look at you today and I think, man, there's, there's all kinds of people in here that have encouraged me. There's all kinds of folks in here that have, have sent me a prayer just when I needed it. Have spoken some, some word of affirmation into my, into my life when I really needed it. Some of you, we go to the mailbox every once in a while, and man, out of the mailbox is a little note with a little gift card in it that says, here, have a night out on us. You need some time with just you and your wife. Thinking, I didn't deserve that. Could they tell? How did they know? <laughs> Am I frazzled? Do I have to look at my face? If I'm about to kill my children, you know, what am I going to do here? Do I need that pattern out there? No, they just wanted to encourage love that. I love to do that for others. You know, it doesn't come naturally for me. It really doesn't. I'm more of a cut up. I'm more of a, you know, um, form relationships by teasing and cutting up with each other and things like that. It's hard for me to, you know why? Because I think about myself a lot. My struggles. My concerns. My troubles. I'll be honest, I'm going to tell you, this, okay, when you come into the church and you have to take your spiritual gift analysis and you fill all that out and you bring it in with the leadership and the work, I did the same thing when we started. And my lowest one was mercy. Mercy and encouragement were my lowest gifts. And I'm thinking, how can I be a tender, compassionate, loving shepherd of people if I'm not merciful? If I'm putting myself first all the time, it had changed a whole lot of me. A whole part of, of the way I see you and the way I look at you and, and, and the way I, I want you to learn. There's some of you that know better than others. And this is number two. It requires more than a superficial knowledge. There's some of you I just know your name. I know some a little bit more about others of you. I know where you work and, 
and I know kind of what you do. I know a little bit about yourself and your wife. And some of you, I know that you have three, three kids, but I, I don't know their names. Some of you, I know your children's names, but I can't remember what their life would be if, you know, how long you've been here or, or when you started coming or anything like that. And then there's some of you, I know probably better than what I should. We've shared together. We've hurt together. We've laughed together. We've shared really deep personal things about ourselves to each other and trusted and confided with each other. You know what requires number three? We've already talked about it. We've got to take our eyes off ourselves and make a deliberate effort to see someone else. Encouragement is always putting others first. We've got to take our eyes off self and make a deliberate effort to see, really, really see someone else. So where are you? What are you going through in your life? What are you struggling with? You see the way he finishes the passage? Not forsaking your own assembly as the habit of some. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day drawing near is the, the end of days. It is judgment day. It is the end of our lives. He says all the more. You've got to encourage people. All the more as you see the day drawing near. It's going to get harder. It's going to get a lot tougher in this world, in this life. Isn't it already? The things that have happened in the United States of America over the course of the last three or four months, we've been hearing about for a long time, and now it's real. Persecution in a different level is coming. It's grieving our hearts. Angel has been keeping up to speed, keeping me up to speed with this, but the, the refugees fleeing out of thousands from Syria making their way into Hungary, and now they're trying to leave and make their way to Germany? That's a long way. There's an estimated 20 million people that make up the populace of Syria. But because of persecution and rejection and starvation, they're fleeing by the millions. The latest estimate today, Angel was, was Googling it this morning, the latest estimate today is 10 of the 20 million people 10 million of the 20 million people, half the population of a country is fleeing for their lives. Hopelessness, despair, discouragement, persecution, leaving by the millions. Who will receive them? Who will bring courage to them? You saw the picture probably this week of the baby that had been washed up on the shore because people are putting their, their babies and their children into fishing boats and pushing them away just so they could possibly find a better life. You don't have to go to Syria to find someone in hopeless despair. They might be sitting next to you today. You might be the next blocker to them in your school. You may share a cubicle with them at work But you have to make a deliberate effort to see them. There's a Hebrews passage in, in chapter 3. I'll just briefly read it. It says, Brothers and sisters, see to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. There is an enemy who seeks to lie to you to steal, to kill, to destroy. How do we do this? I'm going to talk about this next week. Through God's Word and personal testimony. God's Word has the answers. Your personal testimony and your willingness to share what God has done in you. He who promised is faithful. That's what biblical counseling is all about. There was a man in the Bible, his name was Joseph. He was from a town called Cyprus. But Joseph of Cyprus wasn't good enough for the people in the early church because of his nature and because of his uh, ability to encourage others, they changed his name. Did anyone change your name because of what is flowing out of you, because of the love of Christ is flowing into you and what's coming out of you, could your name be changed? I'll close with this today. No commentary, I promise. I'll close with this. We have this treasure, folks. We have this treasure in earthen vessels 
so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. It's not your word that encourages. It's not just your testimony that encourages. It's about the greatness of God and what he's done in you. He who promised is faithful, absolutely he's faithful. Let me tell you all about it. But check this out. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. You felt any of those? Listen to it. Therefore, do not lose heart. Receive the encouragement from his word today. Receive the encouragement from me today. Receive the encouragement from others today. Do not lose heart. He who promised is faithful. And though our outer man may decay, yes, that's going to happen. Our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. You know the guy that wrote this? He'd been stoned. He'd been beaten. He'd been imprisoned. He'd been shipwrecked. He said this momentary light affliction. What momentary light affliction today is producing in you an eternal weight of glory far beyond anything that you could possibly dream of today? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. People of God, members of Faith Church, friends, family members, for those of you that have been listening to this today, for those of you that, that have been looking into the scriptures of this today, hear this word. You are not alone. You may be afflicted. You may be perplexed. You may be struck down. You may be underneath the burden of it. And listen to his words. Do not lose heart. Take courage. Be a good cheer. Do not be afraid. In this world there will be tribulation, yes. In this world there will be trial, yes. In this world there will be great struggle, yes. But I overcome the world. You there today? Receive this encouragement. Maybe you've come through it today. And your eyes have beheld someone in this room that needs your touch. Maybe you know someone at work and maybe the invitation today is instead of coming to the altar on your own for your own behalf, maybe you need to come today and, and you just need to write a note. Maybe you need to pull out your phone, send a text. Maybe you need to, to call someone right here in the middle of the invitation, step out and say, do not lose heart, I know where you are. And I'm sorry you're there. But I want you to know you're not alone. I'm with you. And the one who promised is faithful. And he is with you. Be encouraged. Be of good cheer. The one who has overcome the world has overcome all of your problems already. And he's right there beside you. Heavenly Father.